Welcome to another episode of The World Beyond Belief. We're thrilled to have Oli Demigard with us again today, and he has some wonderful things to talk about. I'm your co-host, Mindy Erkin, and with me today, as always, is your host, Dr. Paul Marco. Hi. Welcome to The World Beyond Belief. We're happy to have Oli back with us. What better person to have during the end of the Bilderberg meeting... Uh, to bring us up to date on what what might be happening there, news there. Also, he just came back from the Open Mind Conference, so he can catch us up on that. He's been working on the Full Circle Project. Actually, he's dragging himself to the microphone. He's tired. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, some some new new, uh, happenings in Portugal. So without further ado, let's welcome Oli Damagard. Oli... Good to see you again. Good to see you're healthy. Good to see you, Paul and Mindy. Thank you so much for having me back on the show. So, how would you like to start? Would you like to start with the Bilderberg, with the Open Mind? I would say that 2015 is the year. I've been saying that a lot. And uh, I think uh, some amazing things are happening. It's like everything is falling into place. As all kind of birth, this it's painful at times, but it's just uh, you've got the contractions you have to be aware of. <laughs> they're, not, right. they're mandatory. You can't get around them. <laughs> I'm sure Mindy can tell us more about that than, than we know, but it's sort of like it's like there's a birth, uh, an ongoing birth, I would say, for humanity to come to the next level. And uh, it might look painful and scary but it's just part of the the whole game and it's just a beautiful thing to be part of we should be very proud that we're here at this time and proud of ourselves that we that uh, we are still standing because they've tried to and so the Bilderberg meeting last year Bilderberg as soon as I mentioned Bilderberg we just shut down that's right Bilderberg, the minute you said that word, it went off. So <laughs> it was almost funny, wasn't it? When I said the word Bilderberg, just, everything just shut down. Absolutely, right away. Uh, looks like the scariest year ever, but uh, could be birthing pains. I I think what we're seeing is that the 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 dragon has nowhere to go and it's actually already slain in my opinion because uh, there's such an awakening going on you know that, that uh, even though you won't see it when you look out the window and look people in the street I uh, group used to meet in great secrecy absolute top secret uh, and they were they changed the uh, location from year to year to year different places uh, different venues every year with massive security and so on. Then 2014 was the first year they really went open. And if you, I think we talked about this on your program last year, it was very different because the security, there was no security at all. And in my humble opinion, I really think they were planning a false flag massacre there where to blow up the hotel where the group was supposed to meet, blame it on the truth movement and thus uh, be able to uh, say that, my God, we need to censor the internet because this is where this awful truth movement are sharing information. We need to ban all rights to meet in groups in the streets and demonstrate and and so on. But uh, uh, it seemed like we managed managed to diffuse that one. And uh, so this year, they totally changed tactics because now, I don't know, I think they're getting desperate because they don't really know where to go because we are watching them from all that different directions. And this year, uh, you know, there were people uh, like Luke Rudowski and Dan, Dan Dix from Canada, they were on site. And not normally, they, you know, the Bilderbergers are very rela- relaxed. Sometimes they give comments and so on. This year, they were just running to the airport, really like, uh, I've never seen them before, in a very, very different behavior. And uh, I think they feel very uh, cornered. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, I think it was the chief of the Danish security police was invited this year. Surprise, surprise, he's never, ever been 
anyone in that his position from Denmark has ever been invited as far as I know. But uh, of course, since the false flag in Copenhagen happened very recently, this is uh, uh, the reason he was there, in my opinion. And uh, I, I just thought it was really interesting because he was on Danish TV uh, speaking about this so-called terror event. And uh, the, the host of the show said, uh, I really want to commend you for this incredible thing you did here. And then he said in the exact word, yes, it was a very big setup. The, it was a very um, heavy workload with the setup of this thing. Absolutely. And very interesting. It's, they had to move the camera so, trucks in and all the other things that they do to produce one of these. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, since we're so focused, uh, myself and others, on exposing these false flags, we're, we're removing a major tool from them that they can no longer use. And if you notice, we had a long series of mass shootings. Then we had uh, Charlie Hepto. Then we had Copenhagen, where with this, where Charlie Hepto, we managed to expose big time. Then Copenhagen, we managed to expose that. We predicted a thing in Florence that never happened. Thank God for that. And then came a very, very lame one in Texas. I mean, really poorly done, with contractors instead of SWAT teams, and where you saw the so-called SWAT team being photographed before the event. You know, the whole, it was just very poorly pulled off. But with the same theme again and again and again, the drawings of Muhammad, cartoons of Muhammad. And because of that, Muslims all over the world would be so upset that they would get their guns and start killing people in the, you know, mass slaughter. Not being upset about all these unjust wars that are going on where thousands of children and women are being slaughtered. No, no, that's not enough. That cartoon, that is the one that really gets them going. So, well, I don't believe it at all. It's the same theme. It was, uh, it started with, uh, I would say it almost started with the um, Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie. That's where they got the idea because Khomeini got very upset and put a fatwa, a death threat on Salman Rushdie. At, uh, at least that's the official version. And then in 2001, there was the Danish newspaper, Jyllands Posten, that started doing, they did a cartoon on Muhammad, and officially there was a global uh, uproar among Muslims uh, all over the world. At least that is what media told us. We have to be very, very aware here because media plays such a big thing in spreading these type of false flags, or yeah. psyops as well. Yeah, with that the was I 2000. Go ahead. Yeah, with the Ayatollahs. Too Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, please carry on. With the on. Ayatollah Khomeini, his uh, his lineage is the CIA. So certainly, his uh, being offended by that was probably uh, inspired by uh, the U.S. It, it's very hard to say because, uh, in my opinion, Ruola Khomeini was a very strong individual. He was backed by the CIA. I'm, I'm not sure how much he was aware of it himself. They helped him in the revolution. But after that, he, I think he took off in a totally different direction that they had expected. So when this thing happened, I'm not sure. It was also in his latest years, he was very much uh, more or less all the time. He was just on his own in a room, uh, very uh, not very active. There were other people behind him, very power hungry people behind him that were doing all of the, the actions outwards. And I think this might have been one of the things that he was not responsible for. But uh, anyway, it backfired big time because nobody would have read that book. It's not a very good book as far as I don't like it very much, the, the satanic verses. But because of this, it just got a global exposure. And I think millions of copies were sold. But then after the Danish newspaper 2001, then we had uh, in 2007, uh, the Swedish uh, so-called artist uh, Lars Wilks, he made a drawing, very 
oddly drawing. I mean, it, was, it just looks like a sketch you've done when you do a telephone call, that type of thing. But that uh, apparently also made Muslims go berserk. So he had uh, bodyguards from 2007, as far as I know, up until this very day. In a country like Sweden, I think not, but that's the official story. Then 2010, same theme, but the so-called Swedish suicide bomber, uh, a guy that managed to blow himself up in the center of uh, central Stockholm. That's the official story. Uh, before that, he made a phone call uh, to the police saying that because of Lars Wilk's drawings, I I'm going to blow up myself and other people. Uh, when you look at this whole thing, very, very good, poorly pulled off as a false flag, I would say. It, it's got all the signs of that. And one curious little thing was that the so-called, the, the bomber that is said to have been killed there, he actually went to the exact same high school in a very small city in the south of Sweden, in the same class, in this, I mean, with the same teacher, everything, it was just a few years after I went there. Very odd, you know. Uh, here I am focusing exactly on that, and then this guy is supposed to come from the exact same city, the exact same school, the exact same class, the exact same teachers. I don't know. I just found that a bit bizarre. Yeah, so that was 2010. Then in 2014, we had Charlie Hebdo, and then we had uh, Copenhagen, and then we had Dallas. I mean, all of them, the exact same theme. It's like listening to a commercial, Coca-Cola, 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 Coca-Cola. That's the way to get it into the subconscious. But uh, this is why it's so important that we expose these things as soon as they happen, so they won't even take the first step. Yeah, you gotta, you got to crack down right when they're happening. You've got to expose them. Did you know the guy that went to high school where you went to high school? No, no, no. As far as I know, uh, I've spoken to people who knew him. He was a sweet guy, you know, absolute beautiful guy. Uh, beautiful wife and child, everything was good. And then they said that he, I think he went uh, on, a, on a trip and then he turned totally extremist on everything and uh, became this very violent person who blew himself up and was going to blow up the It smells a long way from the false flag, and I'm not even sure if anyone got killed there. You know, it was uh, just this poor setup again. Well, it's uh, people don't you generally change like that, and that's a real strange. Uh, it sounds like uh, I don't know. What do you think? It's it's either we're talking uh, either we're talking mind control or a total patsy. Uh, I would say total patsy, uh, or someone who's they, they manipulated with big times. But uh, you know, it's this it's this standard thing. It's got uh, his strange noun, name. You know, they love these Abdul Karim Karim Karim. Yeah, yeah. Long, they... long names. <laughs> when when it's a, a lone patsy, um, it's not if it's a, something that needs repeated to spread fear, like Ebola, Ebola, Ebola. It's, uh -huh. it's just the jingle that is missing. But when it comes to the lone crazy guy, they always give him these uh, very long names. And he's got, had one of those, even though he, he was living in Sweden and grew up like that. It's, it's also where it happened, when it happened, and the street, an isolated little street, but still in central uh, central Stockholm. I just think uh, this one. Also, when you hear the recording, when he phoned into the police and, and said, I'm going to do this, it's speeded. It's, you cannot hear that it's his uh, voice at all. It goes way too fast. And why would they do a thing like that if not to, to cover who, who really spoke, you know? Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to take that recording and slow it down and listen if it even sounds like him. I would be very surprised if it does. But uh, anyway, so here we are in 2015. We're taking away one of the major, major tools that they've been using for such a long time, the problem, reaction, solution one. Because as soon as 
us, the normal people, become aware of how it's done, once we see it, we won't buy into it anymore. And we're not that one. They have to show their real face. And that is a very ugly one that comes up to the surface, which you normally don't see. And I think that is exactly what we saw in Amsterdam at the latest uh, Open Mind Conference, where I was one of the speakers. What was that like? It was wonderful. It was, uh, it was amazing. It was, I had uh, it, the whole beautiful synchronicity around it was, uh, I can just tell you, I got an email from a person who was in Thailand, a former whistleblower. His name is Willem Feldenhof. And he contacted me out of the blue. I had never heard of the guy. He had never heard of me. He found me on YouTube, I think. And we got really in, in a very close contact. I, I felt this is a beautiful heart on this guy. And he said, I really would like to do something, uh, you know, like a gathering of speakers in Holland or something. And since I was on the Open Mind Conference in Copenhagen last year, and I'm invited this year as well, I said, why don't you contact uh, Frank Rasmussen, who is the mind behind it, and see he's offered to help other people. Let's see if he can do. So, Willem Feldenhof contacted Frank and boom, it just took off big time. And just two, three months later, the Open Mind Conference in Amsterdam uh, took place. Or actually, it did not take place in Amsterdam. Because what happened was that uh, the, the speakers invited were yours truly. Uh, it was uh, Christopher Bolin, an expert on 9-11 and other issues. Uh, Ken O'Keefe, who's a very, very strong-hearted uh, uh, warrior, I would say warrior for truth. And Ian R. Crane, who, a, a British uh, man who is very much into trying to stop fracking in the UK and other places, but also with incredible knowledge in different areas. Plus Frank Rasmussen, the, the mind behind the Open Mind Conference, who is also uh, very um, knowledgeable uh, about the chemtrails and other things. Uh, he's got a very scientific background and so on. So, uh, but it was very interesting because what happened was uh, Christopher Berlin has been pointing very directly at individuals behind the 9-11 event and these individuals are connected with Israel. Ken O'Keefe has been speaking very critically about Israel's involvement in the genocide of people in, in Gaza and Palestine and I just uh, few weeks before the event, uh, did an interview on Red Eyes Creations, uh, where went into the Holocaust. The Holocaust, if people are not aware of it, is the area you are not allowed to touch. You can, in I don't know how many countries, it's between 2 and 14, depending on who you, you want to listen to. But I know for sure that in Germany and Austria, if you even raise the question about the Holocaust and the numbers, you will be put to jail. And in my book, that is not okay. As a researcher, you need to have the, the right to look at things. And the truth in my life does not fear in investigation. The truth is always beautiful and clean. It's when you try to cover it up, that's where all the ugly stuff comes from. And here, why, oh why, oh why, are you not even allowed to, to ask questions about the Holocaust? This is a major one. Because as soon as you do, they will hit you with the term anti-Semitic or anti-Semite and, and so on. So just because of that, and because there's so many things around the Holocaust with the numbers and the, the so-called gap chambers, and how these six million uh, uh, people of Jewish uh, religion are said to have been murdered. When you really look into it with an open mind, the numbers and the ways they, uh, these murders have, are said to have been carried out does not match up at all. All, at all. The official numbers are 6 million, but when you look at the official numbers today, 
it's down around 100,000 in a total. That's the official numbers from the official sources because they've had to withdraw this number over the years that have come because they have not matched up at all. And, you know, like, uh, uh, for instance, in Maidanik, one of the concentration camps, it, to start with, it was said that 2 million Jews died there. And now the official store, uh, number is down to, I believe, 78,000, where more or less all of them died from exhaustion, from malnutrition, or typhus. So it is, a, it is a very, very strange topic to get into because the whole thing about these gas chambers that we are being put with, uh, this awful, awful thing, if it happened the way we were told, absolutely horrendous once you start looking into it and once you go to the site i've been to many of these uh, different concentration camps and so on and when you look into the construction of them it totally does not match up at all you know like anything from the chimneys to the gas chambers that are not connected uh, the gas chambers where they said they turn them into shower things and then they pushed in 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 Auschwitz, for instance, they said they could push in like about 2,000 people at the time. You know, the thing is that you can, you can just get 2,000 people in there when you do the measurement, but there are normal windows, there's everything like that. They could just, the doors, they could have just pushed them out if they, were, they wanted to, you know, knock out the windows, nothing like that. And it turns out that afterwards, the, uh, when you look into it, these things were reported by the Soviet troops after they uh, entered into Germany and, and started liberating these camps. These numbers were delivered by the Soviet, and it's also they had admitted that they rebuilt these things. They opened up the holes in the roof where Cyclone B said to have been thrown in. They were the ones building the chimneys. They were the ones doing all of these alterations to make it look like gas chambers, which was not there. So the big question is why on earth would the Soviets do a thing like this. But this is where you have the Yalta, the, the Yalta conference where, where Stalin and, and Roosevelt and Churchill met and when they started de dividing the whole of Europe and, and the world between them uh, after the Second World War, the, the whole preparations. And I think there was a big demand to get the attention away from these awful things that happened in Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima. And Russia. And Russia. You know, from, from the Allies' point of view, how to get the attention away from them having done extreme war crimes and get the attention to put, put, start pointing at the losers of the war, in this case, the... Uh, the German or the Nazis of, of Germany. But I, I don't really want to go into so much uh, detail about this. At the moment, I'm, I'm involved in a book project together with uh, Professor Jim Fetz, uh, Jim Morris, uh, Nicholas Kollerstrom, many, many other major experts in different areas around different conspiracies. Sam Gardner is another one. And uh, we just released a book, it's called, And I Suppose We Didn't Go to the Moon Either. And I suppose we didn't go to the moon either. It's a series of uh, three or four books. Uh, the first one has just been released. And it's going to look into many of the major conspiracies uh, that have been presented to the world. In this first book, it's uh, the, the four parts where different experts are giving their opinion uh, on each and every one of them. is uh, the so-called moon hoax taking it totally apart, showing the facts about what actually happened and why the official story does not match up at all. Then uh, the big con controversy, uh, controversy around uh, Paul McCartney and a possible fake Paul McCartney, that he was replaced uh, with a double in 1966 after a car accident, and that the man we see today is actually not the same one as before 1966. The, it sounds totally off the rockers, but once you start looking into forensic evidence, 
there's a, an Italian couple, uh, forensic experts, that have totally blown this case apart because they've shown so clearly that this is not the same person. And there's just so, so, so many indications around this case that shows that this man is not who he seems to be. Please also keep in mind when you look at the Beatles that uh, Paul McCartney might have died, John Lennon was murdered, George Harrison was almost murdered, he was stabbed three times in his own house, and uh, that um, Brian Epstein, the manager, is supposed to have committed suicide also in this whole thing. There's a lot of death going around this whole mystery. Then the third part is um, uh, about a double when it comes to Saddam Hussein. There was actually a double that was uh, hanged, uh, not the real Saddam Hussein. There's uh, the mother of a pilot that uh, was part of, of an operation concerning the real Saddam Hussein that gives great evidence about what really happened. And also that uh, Bin Laden, which most people I think by now know that he actually died in 2001 and that this whole thing in 2011 was absolutely a massive big hoax just to pull the attention away from what was actually going on in the world. And then the final part is this thing about the Holocaust where four different experts just go into great detail showing very clearly that there's something extremely wrong with the official story. But the reason I did this interview with Red Eyes was not because I'm an expert about in the Holocaust and the details there, but if somebody tries to stop us from looking for the real truth, wherever it is, I will step forward. I think this is our, our duty to do that. It's very scary. I've seen several people go down in flames after they approach this area. Their career has gone down. They've been told, they've been hunted out of their country. They've been put to jail. Their lawyers have been put to jail and so on. So it's absolutely absurd what is going on. Anyway, so back to Holland. Well, wait one second. One second. I want to. I want to mention this book. You know, this book is a well-researched book, and it talks about um, various conspiracies. And none of these are mind-blowing conspiracies. These are all things that, you know, the conspiracy community, or not the conspiracy community, the the truth community knows about. I think this book would be something to send to someone who was just beginning to wake up or was was a reader but really hasn't said and started to embrace this idea because this gives them um, some clear-cut, well-investigated cases that they can learn from. I also think it would be a great coffee table book when you invite people over to have this thing on your coffee table. Oh, what's that? Oh, well, it's just a book that we have about different mysteries. You might want to borrow it. I think this is, uh, I think it's an important uh, book that could be, that could be, uh, could make a big difference in people understanding this whole global conspiracy. I think it's going to be a great, pivotal work because it's well investigated. It's well presented. I mean, my God, I, if you could get you or Jim Fetzer in a room and talk about this stuff, you know so much and so, and so many details about the various things that's on there. Anyway, continue. I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't want to. I don't want to no. stop your thunder. No, it's um, also the book is made very very cheap, so that uh, the price shouldn't stop anyone from getting it. it it's uh, less than twenty dollars, and it's more than three hundred and fifty pages, I think. And I, I totally agree. I, uh, I lent it out to some friends who had absolutely no idea about these things. They were blown away, and suddenly they have an interest in finding out what is going on. Because also what I find is very, very important is that after the assassination of uh, JFK in 1963, this is where so many of these things happen. 
And once you look into it, you will find the exact same people behind them, the core group that are just using manipulation and pulling the strings behind the scenes, so masters of deceptions that are involved in all of these. It's the same people that were involved behind the moon hoax as the bin Laden, as the Sandy, uh, Saddam Hussein, as 9-11, as Oklahoma City, and so on. So it's not that we're looking upon a world filled with conspiracies and, and that your mind is just off the rockers and you're seeing conspiracies everywhere. No, you're looking at the same group of people that are using the same methods. Yeah, it's the same people with the same methods. Yeah, I think this is a this is a pivotal book. This could be something if you could find you know, not everybody reads. But if you have somebody that reads and they're interested in investigating this stuff or knowing about a great this is a big mystery. We're all involved in a world that's full of mystery. And it's all being covered up by the by the mainstream controlled media. So if you can get um this kind of information to make them doubt something like Paul McCartney. I mean, how how uh, innocent is that? And but if they could do something like that, you know, if they can replace an, a popular person in the height of his fame without a hitch, without people actually, they in Paul McCartney's case, they publicized it. They hit it in plain view. So it's amazing. And I think, uh, I think you guys picked the perfect combination for this first book. A little bit about the Middle East, a little bit about the moon, which is going to be hard for a lot of people, uh, and a little bit about popular culture. I think it's, a, it's really a good mix, and it'll be really instrumental in, in waking people up. I hope so, and the sales have just taken off big time. It's it's going really well, so I'm very happy about that. Good. But also, just like you say, Paul McCartney, why is that important? You know, it's, it was a pop group, it was this. No, it is it's one of the most famous people in the world that they managed to exchange right in front of our eyes. This is why it's important to see the level of deception how they pull one of these off. And once you start seeing this was not done easily, I mean, it was a massive operation. And the, the question is still, why was it done? Why did they put so much into just replacing this guy who, who apparently died in this car accident? And one thing is, if you just look at the numbers, because normally when you look into the crimes of this type of, uh, uh, in this uh, type of, of crimes, money, follow the money, is one of the general rules. And here, the Beatles was one of the, I think, one of the major incomes for the British uh, royal, uh, for England as, as a country during those years. So when we're talking big time money there. And as far as I know, MI5 was involved in as well in the whole thing. And... Uh, the Tavisog Institute, and I mean, there's many, many mysteries around this group, the Beatles, big time. Yeah, the Beatles made a song called Tax Man. Do you remember that song? <laughs> I do indeed. Yeah, they, they I, probably were a, a major source of income for the uh, for the UK. Besides yeah, being... Also, it, it seems like... It, uh, the, uh, John and, uh, you know, especially John, uh, try to get plausible denial. I think he knew that one day this would be uh, exposed, you know, and and to just cover his own butt. Uh, maybe they were forced into, into into this conspiracy, but to cover him himself, uh, it seems like he's left a lot of clues in the lyrics and together with the rest of the band in their covers in everything around. I mean, it's. So, so many things that are pointing at this thing, including a former wife of, of Paul McCartney, who's just been on on uh, many uh, TV shows saying that she's been threatened and 
and there's this amazing secret around Paul McCartney and if she if she does not shut up she would be she's been threatened to be taken out and so on. Then they came to some kind of financial agreement and after that uh, she went quiet. But uh, also, I mean, just the, the height of the guy, it's not, he's a lot taller, you know. There's some, you know, you can fix facial structures, you can fix things, but, uh, you know, teeth, ears, length, the size of the head compared to the shoulders, these type of things you cannot alter. And here we have, uh, there's some very odd things going on. Also, the way that Paul, or Paul as he's called by the other members of the band, uh, how he talks about Paul McCartney or of himself as being like two people, one that is trying to live the other person's life and, and so on. And there's, if you go on YouTube and you put in Paul McCartney with an F, uh, I'm sure you will find different uh, interviews, where especially George Harrison keeps repeating Paul. He does not say Paul, he says Paul repeatedly. And uh, so... It's a it's a very very odd thing. Yeah, it's interesting also because uh, the whole group supposedly, according to Doctor John Coleman, is a Tavistock production. Yeah. Yeah. So it it, it I, I tell you, Paul. I don't know about you, but for me, the last ten fifteen years of research, it's it's like it's it's like feels like my brain is being pulled apart. Sometimes it's it's almost almost painful because. I thought I knew things, and then it turns out to be built on lies. I thought I knew facts, and then it turns out they were lies as well. I thought I knew about history. Sorry, ah, wrong again. <laughs> and it's, it's just like, uh, sometimes I'm just sitting, shaking my head, feeling, oh my God, poor people that are not used to looking into these things. This will just blow the, the lid of their head off, you know. Right. That's so... Uh, it's part of the awakening. But it is part of the awakening. It's like there's this unlearning process as well, as well as learning. You have to unlearn everything, or not everything, but a lot of the things you thought you knew to be able to see what actually is the truth. And one of the major truths is that history is always written by the people who won the battle or who is ruling. You never hear the other story side of the story. And here we are. Once again, that goes right back to the Holocaust. <laughs> it doesn't. Do right. It doesn't. Do. Anyway, so if we go to Amsterdam, 2015, like I said, I had the great honor of being uh, invited as this, one of the speakers together with Ken O'Keefe, Christopher Bolin, Ian Crane, Frank Rasmussen. And uh, the whole idea was that this was to uh, be located, the event was to be located at uh, an old school in the outskirts of Amsterdam, beautiful place. And this had been prepared for months and everything was fine. And then just a few weeks before the event, suddenly one of the major newspapers in Amsterdam started, I would call it a smear campaign against us and especially Christopher Bolin calling it uh, a gathering for anti-Semites and that uh, they put a lot of pressure on the owners of this property of this old school. So in the end, they pulled out. They said, e either you get some of the speakers off the program or we need to pull out. So thank you, Willem Feldenhoff, for your brave heart. He stood his ground and he said, absolutely not. Then we would just relocate. What he was not aware of was that this old school was right, as far as I know, in the middle of the Jewish center of Amsterdam. There's, the synagogue is very close and there's some Jewish uh, businesses uh, uh, nearby as well. So this has, it seems like it stirred a lot of, of emotion around this. I, I just want to point out, when I talk about Jews or, or um, Muslims or whatever, I'm talking about individuals. I could not care less if they were Catholic, if they're Christian, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, blue, red, green, blue, white. It doesn't matter. When I look at these things, I look at individuals and their actions or and their crimes. So for me, Jews or not Jews does not matter at all if they've got a good heart and they, they treat people around them with respect. I love them. Yeah. 
Here we are, though, in the capital, the most laid-back capital in the world, officially Amsterdam, where you can smoke pot, you can do, you got red barn with naked women in the, in the windows where everybody can see them on a Sunday afternoon walking down the street with your children and so on. Very, very laid back, open minded, officially. So that this happened in Amsterdam, I thought was amazingly incredible, beautiful, because this was when this dark force under the surface had to show its ugly face. Anyway, so Willem stood his ground, said absolutely no way the program stands. And so he relocated. And once again, back to incredible synchronicity, uh, one of his best friends were, he, was, he had just been involved in a major car accident. He broke 13 of his ribs and was oh. in hospital when he was uh, forced to find a new place because they were looking for a place where they could have like yoga events or, or alternative things. And so he had been looking for different places, but uh, were, they, they were not able to do it. Then while he was in hospital, his wife called and said, listen, I found this beautiful place, absolutely stunning place. It's a bit outside Amsterdam, beautiful surroundings, and it's got the permission to do and arrange things like the Open Mind Conference. So just a f within a few days, I mean, the whole thing just fell into place. And this man with his broken ribs came there, opened up the, this place for us to have the Open Mind Conference. And due to this whole thing in media, it just created more awareness of it. So it was packed when, it's, when it started. It's called cool, Dylan. Anyway, all the time, when while preparing these things, because uh, Willem was of course under a lot of pressure, and uh, uh, some of the other speakers were, were felt pressured as well. I just felt absolutely wonderful. Let's just go there. We come in peace. We're going to stay there in peace. We're going to talk in peace, but totally fearless about the truth, and we're going to live in live in peace. Whatever they do, we will come in peace. So um, we came there, and it was just uh, the police had been there, you know, but instead of being intimidated, uh, they were welcomed, and in the end, they were offered their support and assistance, you know, very kind and friendly police officers. And then the whole event took place, and it was just a beautiful experience with beautiful people in the audience, beautiful speakers, be very it had a lot of power what was being said there, but it, it came out absolutely incredible in the end. And so instead of a two-hour event, uh, no, two-day event, uh, it had to be pushed into one day. So people were there for 12 hours, and as far as I know, no one left. Everybody was there the whole day. And then on Sunday, we met um, in a park, a public park in the middle of Amsterdam, where... Quite a few of them came as well, and, and uh, uh, we, the speakers, uh, sat around. Whoever wanted to approach and ask questions or talk or whatever was welcome. So, and the weather was super beautiful, hardly any chemtrails, and it was just stunning. The whole thing was just beautiful. Wow, it sounds great. I wish I was there. Wish I had gone. Yeah, I wish you had been there as well. Mm. Can I? Point one thing out as well. When this whole thing started, uh, there was a um, female government official. Her name is Yasmina Haifi, and she was she's working with the Justice Department, Department, the Division of the Terrorist Prevention. I mean, this is a somebody who who I think uh, could be in very. It could be very good for her to come there, or at least... Anyway, she had, a few months ago, she talked about ISIS openly as being, I think, a, a work of the CIA and the Mossad together. That really got them there. She got pushed up against the wall, warned, and said, you need to back off here. Anyway, a few days before this event, I think on Twitter or Facebook or something like that, she said that she was going to come to this event. Uh, and this made uh, 
once again the power behind the, the or in the dark corridors of power uh, then react and they forced her they they prohibited her to come to the event and they said if she speaks this is as far as i know is correct she's banned to speak to the press for two years or she will lose her job i mean what is that what is that we came to talk about things we didn't come there to start fires or burn down synagogues or, or kill people. We came there to speak. We came there to show the result of research. We spent a major part of our lives to do. We're living this thing. What is the danger? Why would they shut her up? Why would they try to shut us up? And so on. So very interesting. And I think uh, hooray for us that we stood our ground. And one thing I did while this whole thing took off, when they started the smear campaign, I just went out to about 50 international radio stations all over the world, pumping out the info saying, this is what is going on, this is what they're trying to do, we come in peace, we come with a heart full of love, and this is what's going to happen. And that made it you know, so many radio stations started talking about it, pointing, putting the spotlight on what was going on in Amsterdam. So it totally backfired in their face. So I feel almost a little sorry for them, but uh, it went beautifully. Yeah, save your sympathy. <laughs> save, save your sympathy sure, for them. Yeah. I think these... Okay, I'll do that. I, I didn't really mean that. <laughs> I know, I know you didn't. I think that this is a part of the... Uh, the signs of what you were saying when you first got on, the fact that they're 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 scared, that their that their secrets are getting out, the Holocaust secrets getting out, the Moon secret, the Paul McCartney secret, and now ISIS. I, I mean, I think you really have to be under the spell of the mainstream media to really think that ISIS is something other than a uh, fabrication by on the part of the U.S., NATO, and Saudi Arabia and some other collaborators. It, it it's really becoming ridiculous. I do you know I uh, sometimes I think maybe they they hired people from Monty Python to do the script for ISIS. You know because it's just like, come on. Did, 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 do you remember the one when they said that the the ISIS warriors would infect themselves with Ebola and then go and spread yeah. it in, in the Western countries? I mean that is a direct quote from a sketch from Monty Python. Yeah. It, it is. They dress like ninja turtles. They they do all of these things in front of green screen, don't get the lighting right, and all the time sponsored by Toyota. Yeah. Every single, <laughs> every single photo you see of ISIS sponsored by Toyota. That's right. And you know, I, I just wanna I, who's delivering uh, the clothes for them? You know, at least they don't have to argue about what color to use, but you you look at the the body structure of these ISIS so-called warriors, which of many of them have been heard to speak English offset, you know, and uh, this, the structure of them uh, or the proportions, most of them are European proportions, not from the Middle East or, or these countries. You know, so I would say absolute hoax, carrying out awful stuff in different areas, that is for sure. But a lot of this is just a massive sire. All of these uh, chopped the head of this one, chopped the head of that one. Did not happen, guys. Did not happen. Right. They're your head. And then you have Go ahead. Then you have these beautiful photos when they're you know, when they're out in the desert praying to to Allah. I'm sorry, a Muslim always points when he prayers, he points his head towards Mecca. That's sort of, that's the whole idea. And these guys are just spread all over the way in all different directions, heading west, heading east, heading, you know, but in the background, sponsored by Toyota. You know, it's like, and you, the tent behind them, USAID, the guns, all of it, it's explosives, everything, spawn, you know, like coming from the west, Absolutely, it's, it's an it's like it's like living in an absurd dream, you know, some kind of weird, mad mind is behind this. 
Yeah, the reason I, I want to just interject, the reason that you say sponsored by Toyota, in, in case people haven't noticed, all the trucks, always Toyotas. Actually, a specific model of Toyota which escapes me right now. But that's why Oli says they're sponsored by Toyota, because there's always a Toyota on the, in the background, or they're driving up in a Toyota. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. If there is a vehicle, even if it's an old vehicle, it's a Toyota. I've, I've never seen a photo of true. ISIS without a Toyota in it. If there's a vehicle, it's a Toyota. So either that is just incredible uh, coincidence or... Uh, but I think what we're looking at is more and more product placement. You know, these false flag operations, they take the chance and they put in whatever they can to to gather uh, income, you know, in Charlie Hebdo we had all of these different types of uh, of things with product placements as well, and uh, they yep. they they're just doing it. It's money, 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 and power. That's the thing. Wow, to, to think that they'd stop and do product placement. I mean, I'm not doubting you. I really think that they do. <laughs> the, after the, yeah, I mean, you've got to orchestrate it so that it. It it looks it looks like it actually happens spontaneously. That's why they do it on these streets that aren't crowded. They're in the center of the city, but they're they're off to themselves, and they can set everything up and control everything. And of course, they they can they control the news media beforehand, during, and after, and then they take the time to do product placement. I mean, it's it's totally amazing. It, it is. It's bizarre. In my opinion, it's totally bizarre, but th this is what they do. You know, like Charlie Hebdo, the newspaper, uh, they went up, uh, it was bought by a, a, a Rothschild company just a few weeks before it happened. It went up with 10,000% uh, profit before and after. You know, these people are not stupid. They know that the whole world is going to look this direction. So. I would strongly suggest that what we're looking at, this is my theory, but I really believe that what we're looking at when you see this whole series of, of uh, so-called terror events globally, I think we're looking at the same group of people being flown from country to country in army planes, so they land on army places where there's no passport control, no all, all of these things, they just come in and they they are transported to the location, carry out the false flag, then flown to the next place. And in this group, you have background extras, uh, you know, uh, crisis actors, where they're, they're the background. You, you've got the same people running around in SWAT team uniforms in, in Ottawa, as in Sydney, as in Copenhagen, as in Paris, as, and so on. Same group of people, you've got the same... Uh, actors sometimes involved in again and again and again. You've got a marketing agency involved with that comes up with slogans and these type of things that also, because there's a lot of logistics that has to be done. You know, all the, the Charlie Hebdo signs, you know, the black and white ones printed in the exact same type, the exact same font, the exact same color to be handed out to thousands of people. How did that happen? How come everyone had the exact same font and color? Where if this was spontaneous, how? Where does all these, uh, you know, like uh, for instance in Denmark, I think I don't know how many thousands of candles that people were walking around in the streets with after this thing, the so-called terror event in Copenhagen, showing the sympathy with the vic so-called victims and so on identical candles that was given out, somebody was distributing them, giving them out, who did that? Who is part, like you have, Je suis Charlie, that is a slogan, that is not something you just come up with like this, you know, and also Je suis, if you look at the spelling, it's almost Jesus, you know, yeah. Jesus, you know, so it go goes to the subconscious and you feel, oh my God, even more, you know, <laughs> Just sweet Charlie, I am Charlie. What kind of thing? Who would come up with a thing like that? A marketing agency, not a normal person. A normal person would say, "I my heart reaches out for the victims of Paris, or I I I feel the pain, or 
my love or something like that. But Je suis Charlie Marketing Agency. Then you have uh, experts on explosives. You got the uh, uh, military advisors who can extru- uh, do instructions on site, a director, and um, you know somebody, a paymaster who take care of funding. You got logistics, uh, uh, you know, catering, uh, lighting, all of these things. So there is there is a group of, I would say maybe 50, 60 people in total that are being flown around like that, like a Rocky Horror Show on tour, global tour. I, I mentioned this, I asked Chip Tatum, the whistleblower Chip Tatum, who's been involved in false flag in his career as well. I asked him, what do you think of this? He said, I don't only think it's possible, I think it's plausible. Oh. So, so once again, this is beautiful because instead of looking at a, a total mad world with all this violence, we're looking at a small little theater group that can hardly perform properly, you know, and that are just going from place to place trying to dupe us. So I'm saying, come into a theater close to you soon. Right. You know, be aware. Right. All the components of a theatrical group are there, even to the point of a dress rehearsal. Most of these have have a rehearsal. They'll have um, what they call a... Um, a drill. So they do a drill. Uh, the, the one, uh, the, the Sydney Sheik, they did a drill the year before. And I think probably a lot of the footage was taken from the drill. I mean, it's it's just perfectly, it's exactly like Hollywood. It so, is Hollywood. Yeah. It is. It is. They even use people from there, I'm sure. But the thing, the reason why these actors, the, the, you know, these when you see the, uh, the family members or so on, that they're so such bad, bad actors is because, unfortunately, they cannot use good actors because all the good actors are already known. You know, they cannot have people that have been seen in commercials or, or school plays and stuff like that. So they need to use crap actors, and they're really bad at it. This is also where you have this thing called duping delight. I don't yeah. know if you know that term, where you have a family member, they keep smiling. You know, they're talking about, well, my husband just got blown up or my father had his head uh, chopped off by ISIS. You, you turn down the volume, you see their facial expressions, they're smiling. And it's called duping delight. It's a, it's a phenomenon when... Um, when s- certain people know that they're, they are, what do you call it, they're tricking other people to know that they're fooling them, that they get a kick out of it. Uh, and I don't know, but it's, it keeps repeating the same pattern. Look at these faces, turn down the volume, and you will see they're smiling. It looks like they're talking about somebody's birthday party or something like that. And then you turn off the volume, and they talk about how the child was massacred or something like that. Very good to be aware of. Yeah, I think normal human beings, when they're involved in a hoax like that, I think there's a conflict between their left and right brain or something. And it, they, 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 uh, they laugh. They giggle and laugh. Now, a psychopath, that wouldn't happen. You know, the psychopath would be I mean, he's a psychopath. He and she are actors all the time. They they can't feel the emotion. But a normal yeah. person, we giggle. Yeah. And I also spoke, uh, I asked uh, Chip, because uh, since he's been involved with these things, I said, how is it possible to keep uh, whistleblowers from stepping forward. How is it possible to to pull this off? You know, he said, very easy. You keep it to a small group as possible. You you secure all parameters. You know, you keep them isolated most of the time, and you just first you pay them really well because for these operations the funds are unlimited. That will make people shut up, you know, they will do the thing and be happy. 
And also nowadays, I mean, look at how many wants to be famous or on TV. They do anything to just be on TV for a little while. If it's a, in, the, in the form of a, a crisis actor playing out being the mother or someone, what is the difference? Anyway, so the fame and the fortune, that's the two first ones. Then if it doesn't work and you start feeling that there are unrest in the group or something like that, you just beat somebody up or torture them or something like that in front of the rest of them. That will shut most people up. If there's still somebody who wants to, to make a problem, uh, you threaten to kill the child, dog, grandmother, whatever. And if that doesn't work, you just kill them. You kill one and that will shut the rest of them up. And it's, he said it's very, very easy. Very easy. People think, oh, it's so complicated. Absolutely not. You just scare this living bejesus out of them. Reward them or scare them. Carrot or fear, you know, the stick or, or whatever. It's, it's uh, classic. Yeah, make an offer they can't refuse. You know, look at SEAL Team 6. It supposedly yeah. killed bin Laden. They're Gandhi. They're gone. They're, they're not around. True, true. And they, they have a very brutal way of covering their tracks, you know, so... I would very much suggest people who might be interested in applying as a crisis actor or nowadays there are also companies in, in Germany and so on where you can apply to become part of, you know, a background extra for NATO operations and so on. It's not worth it. Even if you get it well paid, it's more or less impossible to get out safe, you know. So I would strongly suggest not a good idea. I agree. You know, there... But, no, I also want to say that uh, Chip said that when they have, when they carry these photos, play around, they have like normal staff meetings, or not normal, but they have staff meetings where they meet before and they say, okay, what is the, what is it we're trying to accomplish? Uh, what is the script? Uh, what is the timeline? How, how do we carry this out? And they go through all of these things. And then once it happens, right after the event has taken place, they have a um, second uh, staff meeting where they go through it. They see, did we get the uh, desired effect or do we need to amplify it? And if necessary, they just add another event, uh, a follow-up thing that is part of the plan to start with. So they just add plan B. And often, uh, not always, but often if you see something like this happen, for instance, the beheading in, uh, in Woolwich in London, when that didn't really kick off the way they wanted, boom, something very similar happened the day after in Paris to really stir the whole thing. And then they had the riots going and, you know, these so it's good to be aware of that as well. Wow. You know, somebody should start doing uh, theatrical reviews on these things. Somebody that has a good <laughs> sense of humor should uh, rate the actors and rate the direction and production quality and uh, and all that. So, yeah, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. It was somebody said the next time, instead of a, a driver's license from one of the terrorists, maybe they're going to find a union card for a tr crisis actor. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing, and they keep doing it over and over and over. But now but they don't. Paul, they ahead. don't. Have you not? It's really started to stop, as far as I know. I I have not heard. Of, maybe I'm not informed, but I haven't heard of any really lately. So I think we're we're getting it. You know, making it come to a stop here. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. Yeah, the last one I knew about was the Texas, yeah. the Texas killing. Yeah, and that was just oh come on, so badly carried out. But what I always uh, advise people is that one just like you said a drill is a major part of these things they always have a drill before or during and the reason for that is i believe to be able to get vehicles in position get all of the staff people whatever in position without normal people interfering so they go out publicly and say we're going to have a drill here for your security tomorrow evening at the blah 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 it's going to be a drill about and they even give you the theme it's going to be a mass shooting or a chemical explosion or or whatever terror act or so on once you hear about that 
please get hold of your friends and family. Go down there before the drill is set to, to take place and start filming the people setting the whole thing up. You know, bring your camera. Don't go alone because then you can get arrested and taken away. But go as a group, spread out and film them while they're doing it. Make it very obvious to them that they're being observed and filmed. And that, I tell you, especially if you uh, live stream it on YouTube, there's an, a special app called Bamboozle, I think, that will do that for you. You, you connect that with your mobile, film it, live stream, and just get it up there before they can stop it. And if this might be a drill for your security, but it also might be something with a much sinister agenda. And if so, this could be an amazing way of stopping it. Totally nonviolent, total exposure, and make it stop, which is the main thing. That's great, that's great advice. Yeah, you could stop it, or you could be the person who gathered the information to show, to show definitively that it was a false flag, that it was an act. I mean, maybe you could film the director or something, you know? No, excellent, and especially for someone like me, that type of footage, my God, it's worth gold, you know? But I humbly believe that I've been able to stop two of these false flags myself. So it just shows you, once you start seeing how they're put together, it's just like baking a pie. You've got the same ingredients, you know? And once you know how it's done, you will start seeing it. And then, then you can also see, once they start making the pie, stop it, you know? Expose it even before it takes place. Exactly, exactly. So good times. Good, good times. You wanted to, uh, I want to make sure that we go, we cycle back to that book. We want to get people aware that uh, the more, the more of us that are awakening, the better off we're going to be prepared to deal with whatever they present to us, because we're going to be able to see what's coming. That's why it's important that items like uh, this book, and I suppose we didn't go to the moon either, is important to get out there, get those copies so that they're 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 the most common publication out there, because that's the kind of thing that's going to put people on our side. You see, what happens if if you're involved in something like this and you have no idea that there's a conspiracy, uh, 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 a group that's conspiring to do certain unpleasant things to humankind? If you don't know that at all. Well, you can be easily duped by that. But the more of us that are awake, the more of us that can see it coming, the more of us that can take pictures, the more of us that can um, uh, put things on YouTube, the, the safer we all are. That's why you want to really make an effort to wake as many people in your family and your friends up as you can because in a book like this, it's custom made for that. That's what it's about. It's got credible people, good writers, that uh, really do their homework research-wise so that you could give this to probably the most skeptical person and tell them to debug it, you know. Prove, us, prove, it, prove it wrong. Go ahead, Oli. No, these are heavyweights. These are, most of them are PhDs, you know. These are, and they're putting themselves on the line. They have no, none of us have any personal interest in this, you know, it, to put our, ourselves on the line. In this case, I'm, I'm not one of the writers, I'm coming in the next book. But there's no personal interest. If people think there it's for the money, think again, because uh, normally these type of books do not sell at all. I hope this is going to be a big exception, though. Uh, but there's... When it comes to these type of things, I think it's it's very important to start giving things their right name. You know, so if when you think the CIA, for instance, if if uh, normal people think it's Central Intelligence Agency, that would be sense. No, actually, I would say a more appropriate name would be Cocaine Import Agency. Right. If you get that one, then you start saying, "Whoa, wait a second. 
And when you see people in power positions now connected with through groups like the Bilderberg Group or the Council on Foreign Relations or the Trilateral and so on, if you if you started seeing that the, it was a network of people like David Copperfield, you know, the leaders. If you see uh, like David Cameron or George Bush or someone like that, if you exchange that person with David Copperfield or David Blaine or something like that, an illusionist or something, would you be surprised if they just totally manipulate your mind? No, you would say, oh my God, it's magic. It's really interesting. Oh, yo, 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 show us another trick. But this is exactly what they do. They say that they're in, in government to help you, but actually the word government means mind control, government. The exact translation of the word government means mind control. They're playing ping pong with our brains. So it's for us to start seeing that we're looking at an illusion. They're building up an illusion in front of us. And we have to let the mist and the fog disappear and start seeing what's going on. It, it really is when you see a, a magician and you see he's doing a trick with his right hand and you think, oh my God, that is, that is pure magic. Then when you've seen the trick five, six, seven times, you start walking around him, you see him from different directions and suddenly you see, oh my God, he's actually doing it behind his back with his left hand. From that exact second, when you see how it's done, you will never ever look at the right hand again. You will all the time say, I know that one, and, and he won't be able to pull it off anymore. This is exactly what we need to do. Just put the spotlight on them, and they will fall on their own. Totally nonviolent, just with the power of truth and compassion. Exactly. But you have to be awake. You have to be awake to see these tricks. Uh, in the U.S., they're coming on an election year, and it'll probably be uh, Hillary Clinton against Jeb Bush. Oh, my God. Oh, God. Oh, God. And oh yet, God. you know how it, you don't have to do much research at all to find out that these are criminal families. These are major uh, players in criminal families. I mean, the trick... And there, there are people that are so asleep, they're gonna wa they're gonna take the day off, and go to a voting booth, to vote for one of these people. I mean, it, it's 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 almost uh, shameful, I think, that the people that someone can be that uh, unaware, and it's I feel sorry for them. I'm I'm not making fun of them. I feel sorry that they're that they haven't. Um, taken it upon themselves to find out what's going on, uh, to read books like this or, or many others that are on, oh, geez, uh, that are, that are on, the, on the web and on, on the Internet. I, I tell you, I think we have to be gentle. Uh, it's, it's painful to wake up, and many people are not even aware of that there is a a manipulation, ongoing manipulation. They're not even aware of that there's a war going on against us from all different directions because they, the group behind this, they're trying to hammer us from every single aspect of life. Food, water, drink, air, uh, wars, politics, uh, you know, like uh, Ebola, swine flu, vaccines, GMOs. It's the same stru power structure behind them, and they are trying to do everything they can to get us into the corral where they can totally control us. It, I'm telling you, if they get away with their agenda, we are screwed big time. My God, I can't even uh, imagine a darker future. If you, if you want to know about living hell, that is the, what they're planning for us. So I would, would gently suggest now is a very good time to wake up because if not bad news ahead but if i can just mention about uh, hillary clinton and jeb bush we're not talking about politics democrats republican is she a good politician is he a good politician does they do well 
we're talking about the two people you're looking at are involved in mass murder. Not one, two, three, many. They're involved in drug dealings on a scale that will make your head explode. They're involved, I mean, the, the level of criminality behind the two, these two people we're talking about is, I can, I mean, we, we know names like Al Capone, he is like a schoolboy compared to these people. I can, I, just a few details about Hillary Clinton. In the 80s, there was a big scandal, you might remember. Uh, it was called the Iran-Contra scandal, where weapons were stolen from the National Guard in the U.S., flown in military planes down to countries like uh, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, where they were used to arm the so-called Contra's army that was there to commit genocide against these people. Uh, the, the only crime these people had done was to elect a government that was thinking about the people, not about the big corporations. So let's slaughter them, that was the idea. And in return, let's set up what they called the enterprise, was a massive, massive, big, almost like an industry of cocaine uh, production that was then uh, transported back in the same planes back into the States. Okay. And the, the cartels, the Medellin cartel and other cartels that was created down there was created by the exact same people. We're talking about CIN funded, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, Operation 40, uh, Oliver Norris, George Bush Sr., big time, big time involved in this. To create this, they were the ones that set up these cartels to, so that they could deal with one cartel instead of hundreds of different drug uh, producers down there. So they created this cartel that they're officially fighting, absolutely not. And then uh, they pumped all of this in through the, with these army planes and medivac helicopters and so on back into the state. And one of the places uh, they transported these drugs was to Arkansas, a small little town, about 5,000 people in the town, called Mina, because they had an airstrip where people, where planes could land after dark, and so on, no control tower, no, so no reports written, anything like that. So these planes were coming in, and we're talking about a major operation here. One of the people, brains behind it, was Barry Seal from Operation 40, mastermind when it came to this thing, pumping out all of these drugs that was then uh, distributed out to the gangs in LA, to Chicago, to Miami, and all over the states with the intention of totally destroying American society with the crack epidemic. Not cocaine, expensive, expensive, but crack. So the poor man's drug that would just totally devastate the population and make the minorities start killing them, each other. So you pump in drugs there, you pump in weapons there, illegal weapons into society, you pull down the resources for normal, honest police so that they could not keep up with the crime rates, and then you make heavy investments in private prisons and so on. At the same time, you also heavily invest in the hip-hop music scene, uh, glorifying gang, gangster music and all of these, um, getting the violence, that's the whole idea, get the violence up, 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 up. Anyway, some of the people that personally were there receiving the drugs, receiving the drugs in Mina was George Bush Sr. filmed on location and a man called Dan Lasseter and his partner a young governor of Arkansas called William Clinton. At that time, Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton and his wife were already in deep, uh, deep waters with very shady businesses, estate businesses and so on, where there was a lot of fraud going on. And in, when this started becoming exposed, he started, or there was a long, long row of people getting killed or suicided or ending up in accidents and so on. A whole long line of bodies follow Hillary and Bill Clinton into the position where they are now. A whole lot long row of dead bodies. And um, 
Hillary, I mean, especially after she came into power, she has just gone totally berserk when you look at the action with Benghazi and all of these things. She wants blood. This is a very violent person. Woman, I would hardly call her. Anyway, Jeb Bush, please look at the Bush clan because the JFK assassination, I would say, was also a takeout of the, the Kennedy clan. They even got after... I mean, more or less, uh, all of the the key players were taken out in different ways, and uh, so the Kennedy went out, and the Bush came in, the Bush clan. Prescott Bush, the father of George Bush Senior, he was the the one behind, as far as I know, behind the so-called Zimmerman telegram, which it was a fake telegram, but a telegram that that. Uh, persuaded the U.S. to take part of the First World War. That was the telegram that made the whole difference, I said, to the states. Oh, my God, this is too much. We need to enter. So they got the, the U.S. into the war. Then together with the Dulles brother, Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles, uh, they were part of the architects behind, after the First World War, uh, the architects behind the Versailles Peace uh, Treaty, that totally humiliated the, the Germany and pushed it on its knees down with its head in the mud so that there was absolutely no way of preparing for the Second World War. So the Second World War came and who was funding the Hitler war machine? Prescott Bush, again, one of the key people in starting the two world wars on a certain level. Then after the Second World War, that Prescott Bush was officially accused of treason, but they let him go, of course. And John, uh, John Foster Dollars and Alan Dollars, these two uh, Wall Street lawyers that had been Hitler's lawyers during the war, uh, they suddenly became very involved in Operation Paperclip, which was the export of Nazi experts in, in anything from rocket science to Gestapo up there, uh, these type of surveillance, uh, secret services, these type of things, exported them with the help of the Vatican into the States where they helped to build up uh, the OSS, which turned into the CIA with Alan Dulles as a director and just just uh, John Foster Dulles, his brother, as uh, I think the defense minister of the U.S. Then uh, NASA with Werner von Braun and many other experts from, from Nazi Germany built up NASA, which were the whole hoax around NASA. It's just incredible when you look at it. And they also were part of building up, if my research is correct, the CDC, which is the Center of Disease Control. That was starting in 1946, right at the time when all of these experts came into the, to the U.S. And this CDC is the center. It, it comes up every single time when there is a flu, swine flu uh, virus, or it's the Ebola, or if it's the, what is the latest one, the Mars, or the blown up bump donkey, or whatever. I don't know what they're going to come up with next time. The inside out, uh, uh, I mean, you get tired when you think about these. The inside out donkey, upside loose virus or whatever they're going to come up with next time to try and scare us with. So anyway, then after that, uh, Alan Dulles and other people in the CAA decided to create Operation 40, which was an ultra-secret team of assassins that was to be used to take out uh, uh, enemies anywhere in the world, presidents, uh, whatever type of problems they had, use them. Who was the paymaster? The paymaster for this team of assassins was George Bush Sr. George Herbert Walker Bush Sr. as a young man. And the, if you look at the president before that, Eisenhower, that was Prescott Bush body, that he golf body, that he got in position, as well as pulling in Richard Nixon. So Prescott Bush was behind both of these two later presidents. Okay. So then we had the Kennedy assassination with, where Operation Ford was very central, paymaster George Bush Sr. and Alan Dulles in the background that then went out and was central in the Warren Commission covering the whole thing up. And it has just gone on and on and on and on and on like that.
So we come up to Jeb Bush after George Bush Jr., uh, George, uh, George Walker Bush, uh, which is, in my opinion, totally brain dead person, but where Bush Sr. has been rooting in the background during his whole career. Then Jeb Bush is now coming up. And Jeb Bush, uh, Barry Seal, the pilot that was uh, part of uh, building up the whole enterprise and flying drugs in and out, who's uh, part of Operation 40 as a pilot in this ultra secret team of assassins, and who was just about to give evidence against George Herbert Walker Bush in 1986, one week before the Swedish Prime Minister was assassinated in Sweden. Uh, he was assassinated in Baton Rouge in Louisiana with George Bush Sr.'s phone, uh, phone number in his pocket when he was shot down by, they say, drug cartels in, the, in L.A. But Chip Tatum overheard George Bush Sr. give the order to Oliver North to take out Barry. Okay. But Barry, before he died, he, one of the uh, drug transport that he flew in and out was in a two-engine, uh, uh, I can't remember, it's twin-engine, uh, super-duper Cessna plane, and he landed in Miami, and the people who received the drugs and who was filmed and taken photos by Barry Seal on these two brothers were George Bush Jr. and Jeb Bush receiving these drugs. Then Barry Seals was assassinated, uh, they also killed the Swedish Prime Minister. Oli North had just been over trying to sort out what the hell was going on with the, the Swedish Prime Minister because he was totally out of line. He gave him Oli the finger, more or less. Oli went back and uh, part of the, the assassination of Olof Palme one week after Barry Seal and a whole long line of assassinations around in, in, in Europe and so on that was connected to the same thing. But the plane that Barry Seal delivered the drugs to George, uh, George uh, Bush Jr. ended up in George Bush Jr.'s possession after the assassination. Go figure. The exact same plane, we tracked it down with the same the number, the serial numbers and everything. It is the plane. So here you got one of them, the history's biggest drug de uh, traffickers, Barry Seal, and his plane ends up in this so-called honest politician's uh, possession. Go figure. I just want to say, Hillary Clinton, Jeb Bush, you take two shotguns, you take one to the right temple, you take one to the left temple. <laughs> it's up to you which, which one, which trigger do you want to pull? Right. We're looking at mass murderers, drug dealers on a scale you cannot even imagine, and a criminality that is beyond belief. So, once again, this would be a very good time to wake up. Very good time to wake up. Did either of them show up at the Bilderberger this year? As far as I know, not. No. They're, they're too aware of that they're, they're, the exposure that is going on, so I don't think so. Yeah. Interesting. It's but I'm not sure if either of them have ever been to a, a Bilderberg meeting, as far as I know or not. But the, tri the Council on Foreign Relations, yes. And like Hillary said in one of her speeches, it's so nice that uh, it's just down the road so that we can go down there and be told what to say. And, you know, so it's very easy access. That was what she said, her words, not mine. And uh, She said that publicly. This, she said that. She said that. Yeah, you can find it on YouTube. It's so nice. It's so handy that they're so far, no, not that far away. So you can just go down there and get informed about what, what to say more or less. Yeah, what Tavistock wants us to do next. It's amazing. She can say that thing publicly, and yet someone would still vote for her. It's it's just well, amazing. Amazing. So well, well, can I just say one thing? You can say a lot. Benjamin Netanyahu who is the leader of a very small country called Israel that officially should be bowing to the US. He came to the American Congress, I think it was in 2011. And as far as I remember right, he had 29 standing ovations. Right. 29 standing ovations in the Congress. I, I'm just saying, 
If you took the Polish president and he came to the Congress, even though he would never be in, invited, how many standing ovations do you think he would be given? Maybe zero? Yeah. Sweden, maybe zero. Turkey, he wouldn't even be invited. This guy, 29 standing ovations. I think Obama got 15. What does that tell you? And just like Voltaire said, if you want to find out who controls you, find out who you're not allowed to criticize. Right. This all circles back to the Holocaust cover-up. The ho- yeah. And why is it so? Uh, why is it so important this very year? Is because it's the 50-year anniversary of the Second World, the ending of the Second World War, and that was the theme they tried to pull off with Charlie Hebdo with. Uh, yeah. with uh, Copenhagen and so on. There, you had the whole theme around uh, the, the liberation of, the, of the, the concentration camps and the dates when these things happened and so on. Thank God we exposed it so they didn't continue carrying out because I'm sure they had a whole long line uh, lined up, you know, exactly on the dates when different countries were liberated and so on. Do you, do you know they had... Um, I don't know if I mentioned this, but in Denmark uh, and Sweden after the Second World War, exactly 50 years ago, this spring, uh, there was a um, Swedish uh, man from one of the big banking families. His name was Raoul Wallenberg, who, who is like a, he's treated like a saint in at least Sweden. Uh, one of the things that made him famous was that he uh, managed to negotiate with the Nazis in the end of the war and came to an agreement to liberate some of the prisoners from the concentration camps. So he went down with a whole, like a cortege, like a motor cage of white buses going down, getting people out of the prisons uh, of these concentration camps, and then drove them back from Germany up to Denmark and Sweden, where they were welcomed and, and so on and taken care of. But while this last, you know, when they did the Charlie Hebdo thing, uh, but I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu went out uh, in Paris and publicly and said, "My God, all Jews in in Europe, you have to see the, the, the this is not. It's going to continue. These type of actions is going to continue. You need to come back to Israel. Uh, you need to evacuate." And after it happened in in Denmark. Exactly the same thing. You need to evacuate and you need to come back. And while this was happening in Copenhagen, there were white buses driving around where it says evacuation on the side. And they said that they were carrying the, uh, the Allied forces. Sorry, that's not true. Uh, yes. No, not the Allied. The armed forces. That these buses, uh, they were tweeted... Uh, there were photos on them being tweeted around uh, where it says the armed forces are arriving and so on. And these white buses that looks almost identical but in a modern version of these old ones, exactly 50 years later, has the word evacuation written on the side, painted on the side, and then also up front, uh, you know, above the windshield, uh, they say like... Uh, this display, the electronic display on the top of the bus, also says evacuation. Well, do you think that's do you think that's just theatrics, or do you think that's uh, that's showing their hand? You know, they display things in uh, in public. Do you think how, it's part you... of us? It's part of the psyop. It really is part of the psyop. But do you know, I don't know, have we been gone into details about this thing in Copenhagen? I think we did, didn't we? We did go into Copenhagen. I don't think we got into detail with the Portuguese one that you were you were mentioning. No, again. that is true. That, but that is a whole different subject. But I'd be happy to go into it, though, because this is something I found out quite recently. Um, one of the members in this ultra-secret hit team, Peg... Um, Operation 40, that was created in the late 50s, early 60s, was a man man by the name of Frank Sturgis, also called, his real name was Frank Fiorini, but he changed to Sturgis. He was one of the shooters in Dealey Plaza. As far as I know, 
the one that was underneath the manhole uh, were part of firing. There were, in my opinion, there were several different headshots at the same time that made Kennedy's head explode. It was not a single shot. There were several that was fired at the same time. Frank Sturgis was also one of the Watergate burglars uh, when uh, Richard Nixon freaked out and wanted to get rid of the evidence that pointed towards him and his involvement in the JFK assassination. He was also spending his whole life as a mercenary and uh, almost like a soldier of fortune, but very much involved in anti-Cuban uh, anti um, actions, trying to get back at, at Fidel Castro and so on. He was in Africa as well, in Angola, I think he was in Mozambique, involved very much with all of these uh, things. But also in 1980, uh, the Prime Minister of um, Portugal was killed in a, in a plane accident. They said that uh, the plane took off uh, from, uh, from the, the, hang on, sorry, the airport in, in Lisbon, and it, it just came like a few hundred meters, and then it just dropped down right into an, an, an area, a villa area, that was called Camarate. And the, the, the official story was that it was a, an accident that unfortunately they forgot to fill up the plane, be, the plane before it took off. And so it's absolute baloney when you look into it. But this has been covered up for many, many years until I think it was 2013 that real evidence started to be popping up. And it turns out that involved in the assassination of this prime minister, it seems like he was not the real target, but actually it was um, the defense minister that was the target, who was, uh, he knew too much about this illegal arms trafficking that Ollie North and these other people were involved in globally, George Bush Sr. as well. And he was uh, just about to, to go open with some of this info. So the target was him, and it had been planned for quite a while, and people involved in it uh, was Henry Kissinger, Frank Carlucci from the Carlyle Group, if you know him. He's the former, um, uh, what do you call it, the deputy director of the CIA, which he became after this thing happened. Because at the time, in 1980, was when this accident, so-called accident, took place, he was the ambassador in, in Portugal. And, but the man who paid for, who came, who funded the whole action to, to produce the bomb that was used to blow this plane up was no one less than Frank Sturgis. So here we have the same key people again in Portugal as when you look at the, so many of these uh, military coups in Latin America, same people again. Henry Kissinger is always there, always. I mean, if you want to see a criminal, a war criminal, that will make Adolf Hitler look like, once again, a schoolboy, Henry Kissinger is your guy. And here is someone who is given the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, what more do you need to see how absurd this whole thing is? It's like right in your face. And then Obama was given it, of things to come. I mean, <laughs> it's like, what, how much is needed? Sometimes I just feel like screaming, you know, how much evidence do you need to wake up? This is unreal. If it's like you, this thing with, I'm sorry if I jump from thing to thing, you, you know, it's like the, the so-called plane that hit the Pentagon and disappears into the hole of a missile. And it said the official story to this very day is that the, the wings folded and then it, the whole plane entered into this building made of concrete. The plane was made of aluminum, but the whole plane entered into this hole and vaporized because due to high heat, including two six-ton titanium engines. For people who don't know, if you try to put a piece of titanium on your barbecue, it will not melt. Okay, but here we have it, it vaporized. I mean, 
that is like saying to an insurance company, I come home drunk one day, I crashed my car, uh, I dumped it into a sea, and then I, I, I write to my, uh, into a lake, and I write to my insurance company and say, oh, my, my car has disappeared, so, so what happened? Well, I reversed into the wall and it vaporized due to high heat, the friction, you know. <laughs> would they accept it? Right. They would not. I mean, so many of the things are absolute no-brainers. You just have to look with it open-mindedly with what I call Farmer Brown logic. One plus one equals two. It's not harder than that. Does it match up? Does it make sense? Look at the evidence with an open mind. Turn off the TV. Do not listen to what you're being told and just see what is it showing you? It's a, I'm sorry, I didn't want to go on ranting, but no, it's just no. like, sometimes it's just like I spent 30 years of my life doing like this. All I want to do is go into the studio and make music, you know? Please <laughs> right. help me wake up so that I can just kick back and make some music instead of having to repeat myself again and again with so many other people, even risking our lives for stupid things like this. It should be very obvious, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that we've all been taught to uh, listen to authority. I mean, when you go to school your first day, there's your teacher, and she tells you what's real and what's not real, and, and she never teaches you how to think. You know, so... So the, the American public, and I'm sure the public around the world, looks at TV the same way. Well, George Bush, he's the authority figure, said that it's, the, uh, it's 19 hijackers from Al-Qaeda. And, well, he's the authority, so we don't investigate it. We don't look, we, don't, we never think that uh, airplanes are made to be light, they're not made to smash into buildings. It would be like smashing an aluminum beer can into a building. I mean, it would just crumple. It's, they don't, they, they wait for the official authority to come out. And I think that's, that's a major thing that we're, that we're fighting. And again, I hate to go back to this book again, but I think that when we start, it, it's retreading them don't believe the authorities. Don't believe, don't be obedient. Start thinking for yourself. Here's the kind of shenanigans they pull on a regular basis. The moon landing. The moon landing is a, uh, and NASA, it's, it's, a, it's a fraud. It's a fraud. And you, have to, <laughs> you can't believe what they tell you. What, the Paul McCartney thing, it's simple. Uh, if you look at the photographs of him, I heard that this may be true, and I'm jumping around too. I heard that the that fall is left-handed, and that was one. No, of the, it, no. it's the it's the other way around. Paul was left-handed. Fall is right-handed. So, and that's a difficult thing to fake if you're playing a uh, bass guitar, right? I mean, you're a musician. Yeah, but he started playing the piano and wings. He plays the keyboard. He doesn't play the ba bass. Uh, tricky, but, but also, do you know? After this happened, uh, they didn't. They stopped overnight to do live concerts. The official story was because uh, they couldn't hear what they were playing because the audience was screaming too much, so it just became boring for them. I mean, okay. And if you look at the numbers of interviews they made, they made like twenty or thirty in uh, 1964 and 1965. After 1966, it's one per year or zero. Wow. It's just the most famous group in the world. Right. There, I'm, I'm, there's so many things that uh, are not right around this whole thing. And it, it just, just goes back to uh, you've got to start waking up to what's going on around you and realize that you've got to do your own research. You have to look around because the authorities are going to tell you what benefits the, the control elite. And the control elite's not, at, not on your side. 
What do you think about that, Oli? They're not on your side. No, God, no, absolutely not. The whole idea is that they are very few, we are very many. How can very few control very many? How do they do it? They need to have an enemy on the outside. They need to divide and conquer, you know, to make us see each other as uh, separate, as enemies, as uh, different because of religion, color, race, whatever. They pump all of these things out there to make us fight each other so that they, in the meantime, can kick back, have a nice cigar, throw some dart and uh, laugh at us. You know, it is these templates came out, they were made by the old Romans, if not earlier on. How can an elite few, they call themselves the elite, an elite few control the masses? And this is how they do it. They need to manipulate our minds, otherwise they can't pull it off. They're in the thousands, we are billions. I mean, they are like a fart on, a, on an easy, beautiful day outside. You won't even smell it, even if you try. <laughs> they can, it's like a grain of sand on a beach. That's the size of them. They are that few. And I just want to say as well, most of these people in this small group are not very good with computers. You know, we say, oh my God, they're so, they've got, they're so powerful because they've got all this high tech equipment. They've got all of these, you know, drones and surveillance things and high tech. So, you know, they can listen into everything they do. I tell you, if you get approach one of these guys and say, can you please install this program on my laptop? Most of them would not be able to do it because their skill is manipulation, be devious, to lie without you being able to tell, and loyal with no backbone at all to a cause that is absolutely awful. That is the talent that most of these people have. And to smile when they stab you in the back. Okay. But the high tech thing, it's only because we are in their game. We do it for them. We keep track of each other. We survey each other. We put uniforms on and kill each other. We hate each other because somebody is one black and green and blue and yellow. Somebody says he's Catholic, you must hate him. Well, he's Christian, then you must hate him. God is on our side. They're playing us against each other, you know. And this whole high-tech thing, it's only because we help them. Without us, they are nothing. They are nothing. And, but you have, just like in The Wizard of Oz, you have to become aware of that we are, being, we are facing the biggest propaganda machine the world has ever seen, and most of us are not aware of it. They are using everything that they can to manipulate us through... TV, listen to the word programs, not, uh, it's a word by their choice, that's what they do, they program us to believe that everything is good, as long as we keep shopping and just care about ourselves and worry about ourselves, not about our fellow human being, be totally selfish and egoistic and hate people around us, then we're fine. The thing is that if you look at a child when it's born, it's born with a pure heart, it won't step on ants, it would look at them with, with awe, it would pat a lion on its head. The, the, the animals won't hurt a child either because it's so pure, so beautiful. And we have the same heart, we have just forgotten about it. They have manipulated our minds so much that we're in this fog, not listening to our heart, because in our heart we know what is right and what is wrong. We know it. You can do things, but you're inside you, you will know. When you hit somebody, something inside of you say, ah, ah, not good, not good, stop it. Or we can just totally push down the, this silent voice inside of us with drugs and alcohol and whatever, and keep beating our wife and something. But it will come up in the end. It is there. And it will destroy you from inside, either from cancer or all of these things, or awful nightmares. People like Chip Tatum have awful nightmares. Gunslingers in the Old West were haunted by the 
their nightmares where the ghosts of people they had killed and so on. We, pr we set up like this. We created in a beautiful way with a mechanism inside of like a GPS system saying good, bad. There's a reason why good, bad because then you have a choice. So if we, if we start choosing good on a regular basis, I tell you, your life will start straightening up and come into a beautiful road, especially if you start following your compassion, the thing that gives you goosebumps. That is the, the direction of your life. If you don't know what to do with your life, look, what, what gives me goosebumps? Follow that one, and doors will start opening up. And then keep the feelings, uh, when you're feeling bad or negative or, or depressed, or something, that is a total perfect sign you're off track. When the more you get back into harmony, where you feel good, where you feel empowered, that's the GPS saying, on track. Your mind might say, oh my God, this is the wrong way to go. I'm never going to make a living of that. Or I should do as he says, or I should follow orders. Follow your passion, follow your compassion, and listen to your heart. Especially if you're in a position where you can hurt people, like if you are in a uniform or something like that, please don't listen to me, listen to your heart. You know, you know inside of you what is right. So the next time you have the finger on the trigger, trigger and you have the possibility of ending somebody's life here on earth, it's not up to you. And it will kill you as well in the long run. This is why there's so many suicides of returning veterans and so on. I mean, there are more people, as far as I know, uh, veterans that kill themselves in suicide than are killed in action. And this whole thing about going out to war to defend thing, absolute bullshit. It is so, it, it is the, one of the most gross lies ever told. This whole thing, especially in the States, where you talk about the defense industry, the defense department, it has nothing to do with defense. It's like, it's like Mike Tyson going into nursery and kicking around babies, and you say, well, it was an evil, even fight because the baby was shouting at him, you know. The States have the, the force, the military force, compared to the, the whole rest of the world, in combined, as far as I know. So where is the defense? Who would even pick up on you? No one, absolutely no one with their mind intact. So it has nothing to do with defense. It is total aggression. Total aggression. And it has to stop. It really has to stop. We had to take the, the swords and make them into plows. You know, let's use all of this technology, change it around and make it into something that will help humanity, that will just boost the globe. You know, all of these patents that have been suppressed and, and hidden away, that is for the good of humanity. All of these weapons, I mean, what took down the two buildings? What pulverized, dustified these two twin towers? That immense energy weapon must be able to be transformed into something that can create an incredible energy for the good. So I would suggest to the members of the elite, if I can speak directly to them, that please have the balls to step forward. Look at the Bilderberg meeting now. They're, these members are running like cockroaches. I tell you, when you look at them, it's right there on YouTube, these are not comfortable people. They are running, hiding away into the planes because they know, oh my God, what are we going to do? There's nowhere to hide, there's nowhere to go. And I say, hallelujah, baby, smell the coffee in a totally non-violent way. We're not here to massacre you or string you up, at least not if I had any say. Absolutely not. But you have to stand up, get some kind of courage and stand up, become a whistleblower and expose what you have been part of. Whatever your part have, please step forward, offer it as a, a gift of reconciliation. And while you're at it, bring some of these patents forward. 
that you have so proudly hidden away for such long. Bring these gifts forward. That will help to calm people down and also stop stealing from it. Once you stop stealing all of these things, people, money will start returning to, to normal people. You know, these $2.3 trillion, that was the trillion with a T. Do you know how many zeros that are? I mean, it's, it's, you, can't, you can hardly write them. You know? Just return maybe two trillions to where they belong. That would just set the whole Western world on their feet right away, boom, like this. Anyway, really, I am tired. I'm very, very tired. And I think, so are you. It is enough. Let's just give it up. It's just a matter of time anyway. So I have some kind of balls. Step forward. Instead of being 1%, be one of 100%. Let's embrace on the other side. But you need to have some kind of courage and step up and do this. Otherwise, this might end ugly. So the sooner you do it, the better. I tell you, so many people will embrace you. They will, they will say they will embrace you. Admire your courage to step forward instead of being a weak coward hiding on a uh, desk somewhere, shivering, you know. Courage is something that life empowers and, and embraces, and most people do that as well. So the, the earlier on you, stay, you do this, the better for all of us, even if it is scary. I can totally understand if you cry when you go to bed, that you don't know where to go, because there is nowhere to go. It is just like a birth. There is no way for the baby to go except out. Forward is the way. And on the other side, there's a beautiful new life waiting for all of us. But you have to stop messing us up. It is enough. It really is enough. And now... I am going to be quiet. That's, that's very inspiring. I feel like putting some music behind that and just putting that out on its own. That was very nice. Hey, before, I, before you get away, I want you to tell a little bit about the Full Circle Project. I know you were intimately involved in that, and that's something that could turn this, everything around, right? I, I truly believe that so many people are doing so much good at the moment. Uh, these so-called dark forces are pushing us into a position where people are really getting into action, and it's, it's wonderful to see. And I have the privilege of being part of a, a core group around what is called the Full Circle Project, which was an idea from Max Egan from Australia. Uh, and in this uh, core group, it's... Uh, Sam Gardner, Max Egan, a beautiful woman called Louise Sutton, and a, a man called Michael from Sweden. There's other people, a programmer in England and so on. The whole idea is, it's nothing new in some ways, but it is, a, I hope, in a form that can really make a difference. The idea is, that there are two different aspects to it. There's one where there's going to be a website, it's almost done now, where what you can do is you can go in and it's called the, the I think it's called the locator, you can go in and put yourself on a map, uh, place, you know, like a, on a Google map, somewhere in the area where you are, you don't have to put your own name or anything like that, your address or anything like that, but just put yourself in the area where you think that you can make a difference or you want to make a difference. And then you write in what areas uh, that you see as a problem, where, where you see this is where there's some, something needed, or in, a, in an area where you want to be act, active, you know, if it's uh, against GMOs or chemtrails or vaccines or whatever it is. And then that, uh, once you register there, that would put you in touch so that on the map you can see that there are other people in the same area. What other people in the same area with uh, like-minded, you know, with the same interest and the same eagerness to help and so on. So because so many people feel totally alone and they don't know what to do with this and they don't, they don't know anyone else in the area that 
are interested in this, but I tell you, so many people are. That's one part of it. Then the other part is like a, a database where once you start connect, this whole idea is intended as a movement, but without leaders. It's very important that there are no leaders, no front figure that says, let's go this way. That is not the idea. The idea is to create small groups of like five people where you uh, totally separated groups, just like the whole Gladio network is actually built up. Small groups that cannot be infiltrated uh, because as soon as you get up into the size of like 20 people, then very often some alpha males or women stand up. They say, let's go this way, and the rest of us turn into sheep and just follow. Not the idea. The idea is to small groups, intimate groups, that discuss and find out what is the area and what is the problem in the area they want to approach, either approach either their, their local area or w whatever it is. And then these groups will then um, have one member from each that will go and meet other uh, handpicked members from other groups, and then they can uh, look and present what they've come forward with, and more and more groups can interact but not becoming a big group. All of them totally on its own, with its own strength, and very difficult to infiltrate. Then there is a database where uh, once you go into it, you, you start uh, writing uh, what is the problem the way you see it, what, have you got any solutions, and so on. And also you need to uh, give from a 1 to 10 grade what do you think about other people's solutions that would be presented to you? Like, if this, their idea really sucks, you give it a 1. If it's brilliant, you give it a 10. And every idea that more than three people give 7 or more gets through the filter to the next level, which means that uh, on the next level, uh, like, the really bad ideas will be taken away, and on the next level, you have more qu qualified solutions. So this, in this way, very quickly, you can get solution, really good solutions coming up to the top level very quickly. And this can also be used globally because most of the time, if you've got a problem in frack, with fracking, for instance, it doesn't matter if you're in the UK, Denmark, or Australia. It's the same problem in the States. You're facing the same problems. So uh, this is one way that these solutions can get... Uh, visible and so that you can use them wherever you are. There will also be templates available where, uh, you know, very often it's a matter of approaching uh, the people in, in power, so-called power, with a language that they understand, with legal terms that they, that puts them up, up against the wall. Because the whole idea is not to accuse, not to blame, but find the people that have signed whatever documents, because every single time, whatever the problem is, you have somebody in a, in a power position that have misused his power. You know, that have, he's there elected by the people to take care of us, and for some reason, he has signed over these rights to a company to do fracking or to a company to allow GMOs into the country or whatever it is. The, the, the main problem is the abuse of power. And here, here's a way of how to tra turn this around and by asking the exact correct questions, push them up against the wall and say, spotlight on you, this is personal. You are the one who signed this paper. Now you can have the, the, the uh, possibility to either step forward, become a whistleblower, expose what you've been part of, or <clears throat> let's get up the food chain and take the next one and the next one and the next one. And hopefully, once this starts spreading, because there, there's an incredible interest, we've already experienced it. So many people are signing up, so many people are saying, my God, this is exactly what we've been waiting for. I want to join also. I want to join also. I think it's going to be, you know, like a, uh, like Max Egan said, like a grass fire. What the snake really fears is a grass fire. And here, the people in so-called power 
will hopefully be approached from all different directions at the same time. Whatever people see as the problem, they will approach that. So it will be anything from fluoride in the water to GMOs to chipping children in school to you know, all of these things. There will be all of these things, but totally nonviolent, but pushing them up against the wall with the right language so that it will be a legal language it would be a language that normal people can understand, but also the, the templates that would be available would be language that the people in, in so-called power understands, because they use that language to sneak away and, and do all kind of do devious things. So use their own language and just uh, do it. And, and Max Egan, he did a beautiful thing in Australia. There was a, I think there was a gas well it wasn't fracking, but it was a similar thing in Western Australia. And they were going to totally destroy the air and totally destroy uh, the water, uh, the groundwater there, because they use like millions and millions of liters of water that get totally devastated and radioactive in some cases to do these things. And so what, he, what they did was uh, they approached the authorities and they said, uh, please explain to us uh, since water is essential for life, and since we are the population of Australia, please explain to us how destroying water cannot be seen as a threat to national security. Of course, you have done a lot of research that on uh, that uh, ba that you based uh, your your decision to sign the papers over to these uh, companies that are now destroying the earth, please show us these, uh, uh, these surveys you've done and, and all the facts that shows that you totally know what you're doing. If not, please show us how we should not see this as an abuse of power. Please show us that you are a trustworthy person and that you're doing your job to defend us, the population, and not be a representative of a company uh, doing all of this for your own and others' greed. They, they put these questions, if you listen to them, they're questions, they're not accusations, they're not uh, violent in any way, it's just questions. In one week, they shut the whole thing down in Australia. Hooray! And I say hallelujah, uh, well done, Max. Well, well, well done, Max. And if it can be done there, then it can be done everywhere, you know. Perfect. And so, as I said, uh, it's called the Full Circle Project. I think the website is going to be up very shortly. I hope so. It's been, uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> it takes a lot of work. So the people involved, please be gentle on them. Uh, if you go to the website and it's not fully working or it's not looking exactly the way you think it should be, please understand this is done totally without funds or anything like that, just by, by people with a very, very inspired souls that want to do good. But it will be working and it will be uh, the way it should very shortly, I think. So you will be able to look for it for, under the name of the Full Circle Project. And of course, any other projects or similar, whatever the area, please join up. This is not a matter of becoming part of an organization with a leader or anything. Absolutely not. It's part of joining up all of us together, whatever your group is, whatever, that, whatever it is, just let's join up, let's help each other and, and lift this whole world. Because it's very easy to do. Once again, there in the thousands, we are billions. So it really, really is a joke that we even have to see them as a threat, you know. So, back in the balance, that's the whole idea. And while we're at it, grace under pressure. They will put pressure, they are putting pressure on us, just dance, you know. It's an illusion, you know. Just relax, have a good time, become awake, learn about what's actually going on, Take care of your friends and families. Embrace life. Fill your heart with gratitude so that your spirit lifts so that they cannot control you. 
turn off the TV and start caring about other people around you. Do random kinds of like random acts of kindness. You know, do good, be good. Kindness is awesome. Get back to that. It's not, you know, when you go around with a T-shirt saying I'm a slot or bad or something. Like that. <laughs> Listen to it. It's like what is that? Yeah. They messed it up. It's messed up. Kindness is you. You geek if you're kind. Absolutely not. Look at Jesus. I mean, I'm not religious, but this was a powerful individual. Look at Martin Luther King. That was a powerful individual. Look at Mahatma Gandhi. He walked around in diapers, or it looked like. He managed, without a title, without funding, without weapons, to get the British Empire to leave India, one of the biggest assets. How is that possible? He focused on, on kindness. Kindness is awesome. Love is power. Love is power, and forgiveness is the way. Forgiveness and compassion. We, it's so important how we do this next step that we do not slaughter these people. They are our brothers and sisters as well. Many of them have been totally duped, not understanding what they're doing. On some level, I'm sure they have because their greed have been showing them the way. But they're human. I mean, look, any one of us in some aspect have been greedy, have been doing things we're not proud of. But we need to lift it. The main thing is to lift us to the next level. Transcend this obstacle in a beautiful way. Let's be proud on the other side. Let's not be, become one of them. You know, let's be proud of ourselves on the other side. First, focus, stay in love, be fearless, expose them. Nobody said it's easy, but it's not impossible. I tell you, it only takes one strong spirit to be free. Exactly. So, let's do it. Perfect. Wonderful. Very, very, very inspiring. I want to make sure that before we leave, that everybody has your website. And I want to remind everybody to support these researchers that go out there and uncover this stuff and are able to. All the people that are in this, in this book, uh, and I suppose we didn't uh, go to the moon either. And especially Oli, who comes to us many, many times, and he's always inspiring and he's always uplifting. Give us your website and uh, ways that we can help you, Oli. My website is Light on Conspiracies, which is why I totally believe in not kill the conspirators or chop up them in small pieces and let's make a pizza. Lightonconspiracies.com Let's put the light in the darkest of corner, in the belly of the beast, totally non-violent. But follow the truth wherever it takes us. Lightonconspiracies.com Paula, like you said, I, you know, I'm dedicating my life, 30 years of this, I'm doing everything I can but I need help, like all research, more or less anyone I know in this area, we're, we're on our knees financially, uh, you know, it's from a day to day. We're not living in poverty in any way or form, but it's like how to get to next week, next week and so on. So if you want us to continue, please, whoever you respect, whatever researcher you admire or you think is good doing a good job, more or less all of our websites have donation buttons. This information has come, it has cost dearly. Many of us have lost friends, we had to change countries and so on. But we, we're happy to do that. But please join by helping us as well. You know, whatever you think it might be not so much, it can mean a big difference. So if you want to support me, my, once again, my website is Light on Conspiracies. I got a newsletter. I got books to sell, membership area. This is the thing that is extremely appreciated on my part to help me uh, move forward. Also, wherever, whenever, if I can, count me in. Wherever it can make a difference for the better. 
if you can make it possible for me to come there financially and and to come back with some kind of so I can feed my family as well count me in doesn't matter where it is military police gang members I would also love to to go and speak to gang members or who, whoever needs to hear these type of things because I think it's so tragic to see beautiful young people being so caught up in what is actually the elite's game, the, the so-called elite, I can call them the likeless. But their plan for minorities is that young people will kill each other, that drugs and weapons and crimes will take them out, that they will do something stupid so that they will end up in these privately owned prisons and make a fortune for them. So they're just waiting for them to do anything bad and hopefully kill themselves or somebody else. These young warriors, I would love to go and, and approach them, even though it might be scary, but, and see if I can wake them up and, and get them to see what's going on and maybe turn them into these beautiful young warriors they're supposed to be, you know, and start working for good and use their bravery, but for something good for their people, for us not to destroy themselves, which is the plan of the elite. Exactly. Anyway, so that, but wherever, absolutely wherever I can make a difference, please, uh, I, I want to do tours of, because it's especially when you meet face to face, that is where, where the magic happens. So I'm doing everything I can to get out in the world, but once again, money is needed. As soon as I have it, boom, you show me where you want me, I'll come. That's, that's real inspiring and thank you very much. And if you have some, if you have some extra money and you want to help, um, go to uh, focus on Light on Conspiracies, and uh, you can help only get the word out and do more broadcasts like this, do more conferences, and continue his work in uncovering the dark underbelly of the control system. Thank you very much, can, Oli. Can I, can I just say also yes. that it's, yes. the, thing is, the thing is that this money we're clinging on to so much, if it goes the way they want it. They, they're planning on, as far as I know, this fall, they're trying to crash the banking system, yeah. which means that the money that we have now will be worth nothing. So let's put that money into use. I would say, you know, I'm not talking only for myself, but let's use this money to make a difference. Pump it into people who really want to make a difference, which will save it for you as well, because without that, we all screwed. So I would say whoever it is you respect, please support them to do this because it's for all of us. We're in the same boat, all of us. So let's do this together. Great. Thank you very much, Oli. This whole interview was very inspiring. I'm sure anybody who listened to this thing through the whole way can agree with you that it's just birth pains that we're going through now. And there's going to be a beautiful awakening on the other side for all of us. Thank you, Oli, very, very much. You're most welcome. Bye-bye.